You are listening to the Nightly News Podcast, the voice of the night. Welcome, everybody, to the Nightly News Podcast. This is Professor Paul Miller, and I'm so honored to be joined by the Nightly News CPC film series correspondent, Nick Hogan. Nick, Nick, welcome back to the podcast. It's good to be back. You know, Nick, one of the things that um, we have continued to work on over the past few terms was is the film series, and you have joined us on several film series podcasts previously. And so I wanted to kind of just talk a little bit about the film film series. Before we get into talking about this terms and the excitement that we have coming up, uh, I, do, I wanted to kind of look back to your impression of the film series and, and your experience with the film series. So uh, obviously the film series has been something that uh, the Nightly News has worked with and, and on for really the last few years, you know, ever since I got really involved with it. And we found it as a pretty easy and convenient way to do fundraising. Yeah. How did you get involved with the film series and and how did you ultimately become the film series correspondent? So my first term here, the film series, I think at that time it was Knives Out, which was hosted by Professor Armetta. I didn't go to it because I was under the assumption it was just a one and done movie thing. I didn't know that this was a thing that was done every term. And my first term, obviously, I didn't know you until like the last day when we did or until like a few weeks later until we did scheduling for the second term. It was in my second term when I joined the Nightly News that um, I kind of learned what it was. And I was supposed to, I don't think my second term I actually wrote anything for that. I think that wasn't until my third or fourth. Um, but I went there and I really enjoyed what it was. I'll be honest, it was like almost two years ago, so I don't remember what movie it was. If you gave me a list, I would. I mean, I can't even remember all of them. Um, mix, so don't feel I bad. mean, I know all the ones I've done, but the order kind of gets a little jumbled, you know. And I really, I really enjoyed for what it was. I liked the presentation aspect of it because I didn't know that that's what that was. I thought it was just a movie screening, which I've gone to a couple of those here that weren't related to the film series. I thought it was going to be like that. Then eventually you had me write the story for my third or fourth term for it. Well, if I do recall correctly, you took over for Dylan Bowman. Yes. Uh, Dylan was the previous uh, CPC film course series correspondent after Leslie Heimbaugh, of course, big shoes to fill here. But uh, we knew Dylan was getting ready to graduate. Yeah. And if you recall, Dylan, actually the last student presenter that we had, presented 1917 in his last oh, term. Oh, yes, yes. And I so if I remember correctly, that was the first time that you had that jumped was, into yes. writing he the story. That was, He was the first one I did a film series with, which I thought was perfect because, like you said, I was becoming the correspondent and that was his last one. It was a really good torch passing thing, even though we didn't really do anything specific like that. It worked perfectly that he was the host, though, and I was the interviewer. And then he came back a couple terms later for his own films, which was great. Yeah, absolutely. So... I just kind of got to a point where, especially now, I look forward to it every term. Um, I wasn't able to go last term, which is just, you know, personal Well, things, okay, but... so let's, let's talk about that. So <laughs> last term, I actually got to present, and Nick, yes, you didn't get to go, but it was your birthday, mm -hmm. and it was my birthday, so, like, I get it, <laughs> and you were, like, really cool about it, and you still wrote the story anyway, and I'll be honest, not that I want you to do this all the time, <laughs> You wouldn't have known. <laughs> like, I know what you mean. We did though, yeah. a podcast. You had the chance to interview me. You watched the movie. Mm -hmm. It was like you were there. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, outside of grabbing a couple photos, like if somebody would have read that story and said, was Nick there or not? Everyone would be like, well, of course he was there. So yeah. you did a good job. And I think it was your experience that you had with the film series that allowed you to be Oh, yeah. Care. If you made that my first film series, it would have been a disaster. And I also think I, I had a lot of your help with my first two or three film series articles, I think I've kind of gotten to a point where I'm, I have like a set, it's template. a mental template. It's not really yeah. like written down, but I know exactly how I write it. And the more and more that I see it published, I see less and less modifications than when I first started. That's the whole and point, man. I think the whole, and I would also have your classes to think and other um, people's classes to thank for my, I don't want to say journalism, just writing skills in general getting way better than they used to be. That's so, the point. And I think it's, <laughs> right? it's a good way to exercise that without being graded for it. So it's for a publication that people will see, but it still feels like less pressure. And so I do want to ask you, how did you gravitate toward movies in your life? You identified when you first got here as part of the club that this was something that you're interested in and wanted to do. And in fact, ever since then, not only do you just do 
the CPC Film Series reviews. You also have done a review about summer blockbusters last mm-hmm. year and the Barbenheimer phenomenon. <laughs> and you also did uh, amazing coverage on the Oscars this year, which will be in our new publication as well as on cpcnightlynews.com. What is it about film that's like captivates you? I love visual storytelling in general. You know, I've always, you know, I love music. I love reading. I love all of that. But my favorite forms of entertainment will always be film and video games. I do like film more, though, because I think there's a lot more expression and interpretation that can go into that. They're di- very different things, and I think you can make a case for both of them. But I think film has a way longer history than video games do, or anything real. I mean, I know music's really old and books are really old, but film, just being a visual medium, is so cool to see how society has progressed from then to now in a visual form. But I, I think that it's defined a lot of people's personalities because several people their favorite film will impact like what they enjoy otherwise and just who they hang around and what they like to do um i'm personally like i love a bunch of different genres but my favorite genres of film are probably musicals older musicals horror and like 80s 90s comedy and I think, like Lethal Weapon and Beverly yes, Hills Cop. Beverly Hills Cop. Yes. And then my favorite genre is the, this isn't really a genre, but, you know, the John Hughes movies of the 80s of and 90s. Of course it's I know. a subgenre. Of course it's a, it's maybe not a genre, but of course it's a mm-hmm. subgenre. There's no question about mm-hmm. it. And Because all of his films illustrate a very similar sort mm-hmm. of template, very similar aspects, the way they film it, the, the narrative. I mean, you could, absolutely could say Christopher Nolan films are in a subgenre of themselves. Yeah. I mean, of course, they're in, I guess, in almost every case, they're sort of action suspense, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. But within action suspense, you could put the films of Christopher Nolan under there. You could put the films of, of Quentin Tarantino mm-hmm. under there. You, you, I do think auteurs like John Hughes do have sort of that subgenre on their own. Yeah, and I like movies that are around then because I think they reflect the time that they came out, as every movie does that isn't a period piece. And actually, I make the argument that a lot of period pieces, you can still tell the year they were made. Absolutely. In terms of like how they're filmed, a lot of the writing... But I think more so is stuff that takes place at the current time. It's a great reflection on what society sees as funny, normal, offensive, stuff like that. And I think that's what's perfect about film is that it's all there forever. It's never going to go away. Um, Like every film is preserved forever. Exactly. And essentially, I'm glad you made that point. Every film is essentially a time capsule Mm -hmm. of when it was released. Because even a film that might have been way ahead of its time, there are still maybe effects that weren't as good or maybe the, the... tuning of the audio wasn't as good or you know the the further and further we get along the much more you can do with visual effects and mm-hmm. things like that so well nick i do want to tell you that number one we so value you as a cpc film series correspondent so much so that when it came time to book our spring term we went to you and we offered this to you um it's it's rare that students present in fact, you would be the fourth um, behind yes. Leslie Heimbaugh, Dylan Bowman, Jen Dulac, Nick Hogan <laughs> on the Mount Rushmore of presenters for the CPC <laughs> film series from a student perspective. Because it usually is faculty and staff mm-hmm. here at Central Penn that, that does. But people who are, let's just say, enjoy, appreciate, and contribute to the film series I think we wanted to give you an opportunity. And I appreciate the opportunity. Of yeah. course. Well, when I came to you with mm-hmm. this opportunity, what did you think at first? I mean, I was very excited because I'll be honest, I had secretly hoped that it would happen eventually. I didn't think it would happen so soon. I was more so expecting it near the end or even after I graduated. But I was really excited that it did happen when it did because it was like this is a great chance to do something different that I've wanted to do. And I haven't I mean, obviously, it's not like a show show, but I haven't been on stage to do much in a long time because I used to do that stuff in high school. And even though it's just a presentation, I think it'll be a great way for my portfolio, um, public speaking stuff, because I don't have stage fright, but I still you still get that the jitters and stuff before you do it. And I want to be better at that, especially if considering I kind of get a little um, self-conscious when I do presentations in class, even though I don't fear people if that makes sense. So I think this would just be a great way to do that. Be a great way to share a movie that I love with a lot of people that probably haven't seen it because it's not really that successful at the box office when it came out. 
And it is a cult classic, meaning it has a cult following, which is not a lot of people. Well, we haven't even talked about what movie it is, so we will get there. I just, before we move on to that, I want to say, number one, you've earned this. And you've earned it based on basically the past year to year and a half of what you have contributed, not only to the club, but the film series itself and our coverage of film. So you've certainly earned it. Um, Secondly... I had, you've got some big shoes to fill, not only from a correspondent role. I probably had one of the biggest crowds last term at Groundhog yeah, Day. Um. <laughs> and so, you know, you'll have, a, you'll have some tall shoes to stand up to there. Uh, all right, so let's talk about uh, what we have coming up. So first of all, please mark your calendar. This presentation will take place at the CPC Film, film Series. That's coming up this Friday, May 3rd. At 6 o'clock, uh, the doors open at the Capitol Blue Cross Theater. So when we say doors open, that means that doors will be open and the Nightly News is going to be sponsoring this event, meaning that we will have refreshments for donation. We will have candy, we'll have soda, we will have popcorn for donation. So please bring some cash. Um, we may also have a, a opportunity to Venmo as well. So, But you picked the film Labyrinth, the 1986 film. Uh, starring David Bowie, and directed and written by Jim Henson of Muppet fame. Now, I do want to start talking about this movie. Number one, I would say that this movie is is one that at least most people are familiar with and mm-hmm. probably are aware of. Mm-hmm. But I'd also say this is probably a movie that most people probably haven't seen for a while. Yeah, it's one of those movies where it has a reputation, not a negative reputation, it just has a reputation as being a classic, but because of that, not a lot of people have taken the time to see it. It's not a movie that you just see naturally a lot of the time, like other classics like Wizard of Oz and stuff where you would, just, you would see that in your life. I it's don't different. even remember seeing Labyrinth playing on TV. Like, it's certainly not something believe, that's frequently I've on. I've only seen it on TV on, like, a premium channel, like Stars okay. or Showtime. I could be wrong. I'm sure it's played on channels before. It probably rotates at this point. Yeah, but. but I've only seen it on TV when my family had premium cable. So, and that was, like, eight years ago. So, you know, but even now, like, you can turn on tv any time of day and ghostbusters is on all the or time. beverly hills cop yeah. or lethal weapon yeah. like they replay those those classic 80s films all the time i don't see labyrinth quite as much now i hadn't i gotta be honest first of all i have seen this film mm-hmm. it's one of actually the few of the film series films that i've actually seen coming in <laughs> but it has to be at least 20 or 25 years since i've seen this movie I mean, in all seriousness, it's been that long. And so there were a couple things that I didn't realize here. First of all, you're talking to somebody who's a pretty big Muppets fan. (laughs) Me, myself, and my son Hunter, man, we can just sit and watch old episodes of The Muppet Show and just think it's the funniest thing in the world. And, and of course, the new Muppet movies. And Mm -hmm. I love The Muppets. I never realized until getting ready for this podcast that... Jim Henson wrote and directed this film. Mm-hmm. I think that also like shows a great case of how, just how big range can be for different directors and writers because, yes, it's a puppet movie, but if you didn't know, you can totally not know that this is a Jim Henson movie because there's tons of puppet movies that exist that aren't made by him. So what's interesting about um, Jim Henson, um, and we're just kind of looking this up, The Dark Crystal came out just a few years prior to uh, Labyrinth. Let me ask you this. As someone who's not necessarily familiar with Dark Crystal, would you say that Dark Crystal was sort of a precursor to Labyrinth? Not necessarily yes, like a prequel. I, think, I know what you mean, like as in like the themes and like the concept. I yes. think it's very much a predecessor. I will say that focuses a lot more on the Muppet aspect, whereas Labyrinth has a lot more humans. And also, you know, Muppets are in it. Or I don't want to say Muppets. Puppets are in it. But Dark Crystal is much more grounded in the fact that it's entirely in a fantasy world, whereas Labyrinth is about a girl put there i'd like to think of it as like a dark fantasy version of alice in wonderland Interesting. um i think it was obviously this wasn't intentional but i think of it as like a predecessor to labyrinth spiritually at least because a lot of the themes that would go like the eight the 80s dark fantasy themes the goblin theme would go into labyrinth but i think and i have seen dark crystal it's really good for what it is but i think it's a little too creepy um i think labyrinth executed its ideas a lot better Interesting. Well, I love the fact that Jim Henson is is a part of this. But you know what's really interesting? Even though, Nick, I would say most of the people out there listening or even people who are going to come see this have seen this movie before, even though it is 
38 years old, <laughs> right? It's almost as old as, as myself. 38 years old. Um, it, it's one of those movies that's hung around. Mm -hmm. And even though David Bowie is most certainly not in popular culture anymore, I mean, I guess people know who he is. He unfortunately passed a couple of years ago. And while I'm sure people still know who he is, he never was... Certainly for the last 20 years hasn't necessarily been relevant mm -hmm. in popular culture. However, this film still lasts. But what's so interesting about this, and you mentioned this as well, $25 million budget way back in 1986, $14 million total box office. What happened? Mm, I'm not sure. I think that, and we were talking about this before we were recording, I think the studio relied too much on Bowie being in the movie as opposed to advertising the movie's plot. Um, there's a lot of like retro trailers and stuff that are all over the internet from that came out then. Granted, trailers back then are obviously very different than trailers now. You would only see them in the theater for the most part. But it was just advertised as David Bowie is in this movie. He's the star, even though he's not the star of the movie. It's um, Jennifer Connelly that's the star. But I think that made it so they were so reliant on that that they were disappointed with its performance. And I think that if they advertised it more as the movie itself, more people would have gone to see it. What's really interesting is I'm sitting here looking at David Bowie's page. I forgot he was in The Prestige, Christopher Nolan's uh, film about magicians. He was Nikola Tesla mm -hmm. in that film. Uh, so, yes, you know, Bowie has had some acting chops. But again, when you look at his IMDb page, the vast majority of it is just his music videos. Mm -hmm. um, so if you try to sort of section off, you know, him being in the uh, film as far as other types of films outside of the music industry, this is one of the very few. Of course, he was also in the man 1976 is the man who fell to earth. He was also in Zoolander, playing himself back in 2001. And then, of course, that role as uh, Tesla in The Prestige by Christopher Nolan, which I totally... That's such a great movie. Have you ever seen Prestige? I have not, no. Gotta watch it. <laughs> Definitely worth watching. Definitely different than other Nolan films, mm -hmm. for sure. Similar vibe, but like a different plot, for mm -hmm. sure. I think Labyrinth is different in the sense that it was marketed, and it is, um, a family movie. Um, it has a kid audience, but I think you will get more out of it if you're older, honestly even though it's still very appropriate for kids. But it's one of those movies that I just think would terrify younger kids. That's how, like, I was never scared of it, but I, it's one of those movies where I can see how it would, like, traumatize a young child, even though there's nothing scary about it, like the visuals. And But I think that's why it's become such a cult classic, is that people that were younger then, or even, like, later on when they had it, like, on DVD or VHS, would grow up and be like, what's that movie that I watched? And they would see it, and they would grow an appreciation for what it is. And I've done that with... Um, several movies, this not being one of them. I already liked it, but you know what I mean. This presentation will take place at the CPC Film, film Series that's coming up this Friday, May 3rd, at 6 o'clock, uh, the doors open at the Capitol Blue Cross Theater. This is Andrew Hunter, Nightly News Sports Reporter, and you're listening to the Nightly News Podcast. Welcome, everybody, to the Nightly News Podcast. This is Professor Paul Miller, and I'm so honored to be joined by one of our esteemed faculty members here at Central Penn College, Dr. Ann Bizup. And thank you so much for joining us on the podcast again. It's always wonderful to have you back, and so glad that you're here today. Well, thank you for having me. I look forward to our little discussion. Uh, we're also being joined by Nightly News reporter and West Shore Connect student, Addie McConovich. Addie, welcome to the show. How y'all doing? We're doing very well, thank you. Well, today, uh, I thought it would be great to kick off the the recent warm weather that we've been having, maybe not necessarily today when we're recording this, but uh, been some really nice days out there, and we had Ann on, I believe, in the fall, and we talked about um, mental health and, and the outdoors, and so we're going to kind of talk about that today just in a little bit different of a way. Uh, today, what we really want to talk about is, is gardening, and getting outside and getting your hands in the dirt, and things that you can do around your home, maybe even places that you can go locally, maybe some tips for you know where people can go and get outdoors in as the, the time gets warmer. 
Um, and Addie also was a, a part of the Mechanicsburg Parks Department last summer, and this summer is going to be part of the Carlisle Parks Department. So we wanted to bring Addie in to hear a little bit more about his perspective on this. So let's kick it off. I mean, we're coming here, this, this podcast released here in early May. When is a good time, like, when do you know when it's okay to plant your garden? Um, that's a very loaded question, <laughs> if you ask any gardener. It has to be after the risk of frost has passed. Um, there are a lot of people that I've seen, even people where I live, that these warm days have inspired them to start putting in their flowers, start planting some vegetables. It's early enough or it's late enough that you can plant things like onions, peas, potatoes, but some of the other plants just are too tender. And when it gets cold at night, like last night there was a freeze warning for central Pennsylvania, all those plants are going to die. So you need to make sure that you're planting at the proper time, that the ground is warm enough, that there's going to be enough rain, there's going to be enough sunshine for the plants to grow and thrive. If you plant too early, you can try to protect them from freezing, but, you know, that's semi-successful. I don't know if you remember last spring was super strange. We had a really late freeze in May. We also had like 75 degree temperatures in February as well, if I recall correctly. So correctly. some of the things started blooming and then we had some late freezes. The problem with the late freezes, especially for fruit farmers, for orchards, is all the trees had bloomed. And all those blooms you see on the beautiful trees, they look gorgeous, turn into the fruit. That is the start of the fruit. So when those blooms froze, the, the trees were not able to produce what they are intended to produce. So you need to be kind of thinking that same way with your flowers, with your veggies. As you're planting your garden, make sure the soil is warm enough. Make sure you have good soil. You don't want to plant the same thing in the same soil all the time. I'm not a huge fan of chemical fertilizers. I, I just don't like adding them to nature. I'd rather go get some fresh soil, mix it in. And you don't have to replace the soil every year. Just mix in some new soil uh, so those nutrients are there. And use a little peat moss or use a little non-chemical, you know, it's basically dehydrated manure kind of fertilizers. And that'll help improve the your garden going forward. So I have always been sort of told the rule of thumb is around Mother's Day to plant your flowers and your, your vegetable garden. Would you say that that's a good rule of thumb? Of course, we got to check the weather and make sure we're not under a frost advisory. Some people say Mother's Day. Others wait until the week between like Mother's Day and Memorial Day to put their flowers in, especially things like impatience. They're so tender. They're beautiful. And they grow really easy, which was part of what makes them popular. But they also freeze very easily and can get damaged. Um, it's nice having a little green plant, but you really want those flowers. So you need a healthy plant, and you need to make sure that the weather's going to be warm enough to accommodate those plants. Now, do you grow a vegetable garden? I grow. I have a very small vegetable garden. I grow enough that I can um, use fresh when it you know when it comes in tomatoes zucchini cucumbers carrots don't do really good cuz my soil's really clay so they they don't look like nice pretty carrots they look more gnarly um but they still taste like carrots yeah um who cares how they look <laughs> my brother plants peas and beans arugula spinach lettuce all those things um, it's a little too early for like the lettuces and those those greens, and he shares his garden with me. But one thing I like to do is hit farmers markets. Absolutely, I'm such a huge fan of farmers markets. Locals, I don't have the time or the space to have a big garden. When I was a kid, we had a huge garden. I didn't know that you bought vegetables in a frozen bag <laughs> at the grocery store because we froze everything in the garden. We did the work. So I'll go to one of the local small farms, support local business, and buy, you know, half a bushel of fresh peas. Go home, shell them, wash them, blanch them, put them in a bag, throw them in the freezer. And all winter long, I have fresh vegetables, even fresher than the frozen ones you can get at the, oh, at the grocery sure. store. 
Uh, so I love I love uh, just tomatoes and peppers is usually what we have, but uh, we have guinea pigs, so we've been growing them a lot of food. Uh, you know, they love parsley and lettuces and stuff, so we grow them a lot. Well, Addie, I want to come to you here, and I want to talk a little bit about your experience working with the Parks Department last year, last summer, and maybe we can take a look at uh, your your upcoming job this year. So first of all, tell us what what were you doing with the Parks Department? So I was the guy who did all the lifting. What were you lifting? I was helping out with the branches and all that. So you were doing a lot of work in the park, sort of cleaning up the park. Maybe there was a big windstorm or a, a you know a thunderstorm of some kind. You were cleaning that yeah, up. Yeah, that and doing trash and all that stuff. I'm doing the back area of the park around that stadium. Now, so you would say that pretty much every day you were working outdoors. Yeah, and that heat is... Sometimes it was 99 degrees out. Well, so heat aside, you know, on the nice days, did you feel that being outdoors kind of changed your perspective a little bit? Maybe, you know, maybe you were thinking differently, the fresh air? It was a lot calmer, I'm telling you. Yeah? It was a lot calmer. And so why do you think that that job for you was a, a, a good fit for you, so much so that you're doing it again this year? What was it about it that you enjoyed? Well, I enjoyed, I like being outdoors. I'm a nature I'm a nature freak. So, and what do you mean by that? Do you do a lot of hiking or anything like that? I just like being outside. Fishing? And all that. I just like going on hikes and nature and all that. Well, I'll tell you what. Hold that thought, and we'll come back. We'll, we'll have a, some of our favorite place for hiking um, maybe before we get out of here. Well, one of the things that you'd mentioned earlier, Ann, that I want to talk a little bit about is Earth Day. Of course, Earth Day just passed us by. Um, of course, every day should be Earth Day, if you ask me. Um, but let's talk a little bit about what, what the point of, and I know that we're not all, I don't think either of us are, are Earth Day experts. Uh, but when yeah. you think about Earth Day in the spring, it's one of those kind of things where we always have to understand how much we have to cherish the the outdoors that we have especially because the more and more you look around the more housing developments are going up many of the local farms are selling their land because it's worth so much money i look at and i don't know if, if you're i know that you're not from this area particularly but there's a really uh big area down in carlisle just off of the highway um over near mayapple golf course that used to be i mean i couldn't even tell you how many acres hundreds of acres thousands of acres of cornfields that is now being put into a massive massive development and it's just those types of things really upset me when i think about it of course i understand that we're a growing county and people need places to live but it's just that symbolism of sort of the the small business like you talked about benefiting those farmers going to those farmers markets and and to see a, a massive plot like that go away especially one i've driven by a million times it's just so sad so when you think about Earth Day and, and going out and supporting those small businesses, those farmers markets, I mean, that's just something that's so important to me. So, Ian, you know, what is it about not only just Earth Day, but what is it about supporting those small farmers that means something to you in the grand scheme of things? Um, I think what because of where I grew up, there was an abundance of farmers that supported the community. It's really challenging for me to see these businesses no longer be viable because you can't make a living as, you know, having a 200-acre farm anymore because everything is corporate agriculture. The the older farmers that I know, their kids aren't interesting in doing, interested in doing the work because it is a lot of work. Um, and like you said, these developments are popping up all over the place. Everywhere. We're losing farmland. Um, what scares me the most about the amount of farmland we're using is we're losing our ability to produce our own food. Now, granted, there are some foods that just don't grow in the country very well. We're also using a lot of farmland to grow corn for renewable fuels, beets for renewable fuels, and we're not using it to grow our food. So we are, instead of being the bread basket of the world and exporting all this corn and wheat and all this other stuff at the levels we used to, we don't have the capability to do that anymore. And we're importing some of this stuff to supply our food. If you go to Walmart or Giant or Weiss or whatever, and you read where the food comes from, um, because it's on the label. It has to be on the label. It's coming from Chile. It's coming from South America. They are taking the United place of the United States as a massive food provider for the world. One thing I will say, and I do know that off the top of my head that both Wise and Carnes both do this, they source all their produce from local farms, which I think is is great. It's great as long as 
the local farms are producing that produce. You know, it's it's interesting that you can get almost anything any time of year. But when it's not in season here, you know it's got to be coming from somewhere else. Oh, for sure. 100%. You know, our little local farmers can grow that, that produce during our growing season. Summertime. <laughs> which is great. And I'm glad the businesses support our local farmers and support big business. But what's growing the most in the United States is corporate agriculture. And it, that makes it really tough for the local farmer to survive. You know, Addie, one of the biggest, this is something that kind of blew my mind. Most of the corn that's grown in this country, to Dr. Bizzup's point, does not go for food. It goes to high fructose corn syrup that is put yeah. in almost all of the food that we eat. Uh, I actually watched this, un- I mean, I'm sure we could all name like five and- documentaries out there that we've seen, but there was one I saw. The amount of corn that we actually ingest is insane. Sane, and most people don't really eat a whole lot of corn. It's the corn syrup. And to her point, right, she's like, we are losing, like, a lot of land. Not only that, we're losing a lot of trees and, and stuff, too, because they keep cutting down all of them. Well, we and have to tell those storms to stop blowing in and blowing all the branches down so you don't <laughs> have to clean them up. They are building, like, multiple developments and stuff. I, and I agree with Miss Ann that we need to have more land for farmers so they are able to produce for themselves and us. But beyond the farming too though, Ann, you know, part of what we're here that I'd like to talk about is is mental health that, that's associated with getting outdoors. The more housing developments, the more pavement we have, the less outdoor spaces there are. And now you're getting some of these types of uh, developments that are coming in, these you know boutique <coughs> developments that are sort of manufacturing outdoor spaces. I mean, to think about, hey, you're, you're going to cover hundreds of acres with pavement and then you're going to make a little park and you're going to want us to – Thank you for that. Like, that's the kind of stuff that I'm getting. It's not even, of course, the, the, the land being taken from the farmers is immense. And, and you made a wonderful point. But it's these developments do more than that. It takes away something from our society um, in terms of the ability to get outdoors and get into nature. And some of those, these places we all love are being just knocked down and paved over. And it's sad. We're losing a lot of open space. Would it, would it space... Getting outside to me means being able to go outside, go for a walk, walk up on the hill, you know, kind of explore nature. Um, And that's how it was when I was a kid. You know, we would go up on, there were several hills right in front of our house. Dad would take us up. He'd teach us the trees. He'd teach us the different vines, what was good, what we needed to stay away from. But you could explore and you saw deer and rabbits and squirrels and chipmunks and and how they lived in nature and how the water drained off the land. And you learned all that respect for nature. Now, there are a couple of areas around me like Hawk Mountain. It's five minutes from my house. Beautiful. I it's love it there. a great place to, to go for a, a hike. But for me personally, when I'm out in nature, I kind of want to be either with just a handful of people or by myself so that I can I can see all this nature happening in its natural. One of my favorite places at my house, my house backs onto about 12 acres of woodlands. So I have a swing and I sit and I watch in the woods. I watch the trees dance, the leaves dance in the wind. And it's kind of like a little bit of sanctuary. It's very calming. It's very peaceful. And you never know what you're going to see. There are coyotes that'll come walking through my yard or what I'm looking forward to now is the the deer should be dropping their fawns soon. And in about six weeks, they'll be coming out. And not for nothing, fawns are hysterically funny. If you've ever seen a little baby deer trying to walk, it's just funny. And it's just, I feel connected. I feel connected to the world. It gives me a break from all the chaos that's going on right now. In the world, what you hear from social media, what you hear from the news, what you hear from people's conversations is all about the chaos and the argument and what side are you on and you know we can't just talk about it nobody's allowed to have their own opinion anymore but this is my peaceful spot to be out there in nature walk down the field walk all the way around the field and see what's going on where what it's there we've been hit with the emerald ash borer which is a, a 
fly that actually destroys and kills the ash trees. So, you know, it's looking and, and seeing, yeah, that's that's nature, and I understand that, but to see how many trees we've lost, we're losing open spaces where you can go for a walk, where you can take your pets for a walk, and everybody is so scared of everybody else that, you know, God forbid you set foot on someone else's property and they'll be coming out the front door with <laughs> who knows what. So that that's how... I like to experience nature to just get out in it and observe what's going on. You know, where I really kind of get that feeling, and I do, I do some hiking, and I I like being outdoors, is is golfing. And there's a there's a couple of courses that we go to. There's one out in the Adams County area that it's it's in the middle of an apple orchard, and it is the coolest course. It's not like the nicest course, or it's just it's you really feel like you're out in the middle of the woods playing golf and like a lot of golf courses are like that i try to stay away from the ones that are like in residential areas as much as possible i like yeah i like to just be out there and and be a part of nature and that's that's a way that i i engage with nature as well addy you know tell us a little bit more about some of the things that you do for your leisure time in terms of going outdoors so there's a uh, i live in woods and there's a creek down where i live so i usually walk down there I actually cleaned it out. I got it flowing again. Well, that's good. So I want to end here today with, uh, and your your favorite spots to go. Uh, you know, if you can think more more Harrisburg ish. I know that you're, you you do travel to to be here, but but we can start with Hawk Mountain if you want. I mean, I know that's a little closer to you, but that's definitely worth a trip from this area for for the probably the average listener. So I uh, just want everybody to go around and just give a, a spot that maybe their their own sanctuary, and if some people get out and want to check check it out this summer. Hawk Mountain, obviously, is a place that I love to go early in the season, late in the season, so I'm avoiding the summer crowds. But the Appalachian Trail runs right through this area, and you don't have to – I don't know why people think that if you're going to hike on the Appalachian Trail, you got to go for 25 miles. No. No, there are plenty of sections that are a mile or two, and the trail you are in nature – Yeah, you might have to cross a road now and then, but that's another place. You might run into someone else hiking, coming the other way, but it's not like a huge crowd. There's no pressure. There's no time crunch. So I like hiking the trail, you know, and I've hiked pretty much all the way from Lehighton down to the other end of of Schuylkill County, but I know it runs – near here as well absolutely in fact out in monroe township just off of on lisburn road uh, my friend lives out there and there is a really nice place to park and there's a really really nice section that you can go either direction um, if you go north towards sort of dillsburg area south toward you know carlisle pike Um, but that's a really cool spot that i really really enjoy um, another place that I really we went a few years ago that I think is, is worth talking about and this isn't novel a lot of people have gone there but Raystown Lake I know that that's a little bit of a hike but w- when we went up there for the first time I thought it was going to be like all over built and we went up there and I was shocked because there's pretty much nothing I mean it's mainly camping and they have like a hotel there which we ultimately stayed at and there's some touristy things there but it's it's just all cabins and a lot of great hiking there too so like if you're looking for a cool weekend trip to get out and, and be a part of nature i think Raystown lake's a, a good way to go just make sure you bring everything you need because it's a little while to a store once you get where you're going um addy what are some places that you enjoy getting outdoors that people might be able to visit the main place that you would be able to visit and i think it's very peaceful there is uh pincho okay pincho park yeah there's some good fishing down there too yeah, the the reason why, right, the nature there is just so beautiful and all that. There's beautiful, lots of, lots of things there that you can see. Well, uh, I got to tell you, I hope that everyone out there, even if it's not something that you've done before, plant some flowers, plant a little vegetable garden. And, and I know that, that maybe people aren't, you know, Summer can be a busy time, let's just say. But once you get it going and you, you pull some weeds every once in a while, keep it watered, 
a lot of times those vegetable gardens, they, they don't take much maintenance, maybe an hour a week, if, if that, right? Yeah. Uh, when you're outside. So uh, we, we call on you to try something different. Get outdoors. Go for a hike. Maybe get your fishing license this year if you hadn't gotten it in the past. Maybe get out on the golf course a little bit in some of the more uh, rural courses and enjoy nature. Um, because I think it's fair that we all believe that being outdoors can significantly improve your mental health, get us away of the hustle and bustle of the daily grind, and even all of the um, <laughs> things that we read on social media. Did you want to add anything to that, Anne? Just the only other place I would suggest is Pennsylvania is chock full of state parks. Go visit your local state park. Get to know the park. They all have hiking. They have usually have water features. And, you know, just like you said, take what you need. Take a snack. Take some water. Take sunscreen. Wear good shoes. And just get out and explore the parks. Explore nature. Put the phone away. Put the computer away. And look at what has been given to us by the earth. And my dad was a uh, surveyor for the for DCNR, Department of Conservation of Natural Resources. So he surveyed many of the parks out there. So um, it, it's this is the kind of thing that's always been in my family. Addie, any final thoughts? It's also a good state of mind to go out and, and see nature, feel the breeze and all that. See the animals. Yeah, see the animals, see nature. And, it's beautiful. And get out there and support those small roadside stands and, and small farmers markets. I mean, they're they're the lifeblood of our community in terms of trying to keep our food local as possible and not getting it shipped in from other states or other countries for that matter. And it's as fresh as you're going to get. 100%. Well, Dr. Bizzip, thank you so much for joining us. I know that this is certainly outside of the things that you do here every single day, but I think it's uh, that I loved when you were on before, and I, I love, especially when we're getting close to, to gardening season, to have you on. So so thank you so much for this, and we'll, we'll have to have you back on again talk about this some more. Sure thing. Thank you. Thank you. And Addy, thank you for being here too, my friend. Uh, it's it's always a pleasure, and uh, we'll get you back on before the end of the term with uh, the West Shore Connect folks. So we hope to have you back one more time before you graduate here, coming up at the end of the term. Yay! Yeah. All right, hey, thank you all so much for listening. I want to thank Dr. Ian Bizup. I want to thank Addy Makanovich for being on today to talk about getting outdoors. Thank you very much for checking in on this episode. We'll see you again next time on the Nightly News Podcast. Mm-hmm.